Well, hello, church. It is good to be here. It's good to be together as we worship. Why don't you stand? And uh, we are going to invite the king in this place. We're going to invite his presence here. We are going to meet with him. Why don't you join us as we sing?
place. We welcome the author of our faith. We welcome the God who makes a way. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus.
chapter 2, um, Paul's speaking to the Gentiles and uh, kind of giving them this new idea of what it means to, to, um, to be, for like, what a temple is for the Lord. And this is what he says. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. And together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. And this, this part is good. It says that we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. That through Jesus, through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. See, back in Exodus, Moses was given instructions to, to have this curtain, this veil, this thing that was, was to distinguish between the holy place and the most holy place. It was a separation. You had to be elite. You had to be the leader. Like, not just anyone walks into that place. There was this almost a separation. But later on in the New Testament, Jesus comes. In the book of Mark, it says that through Jesus, through his death, through the shedding of his blood, that the veil was torn in two. So the good news of that is that Jesus actually made a way. There is no separation. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be elite. You don't have to be perfect. Not only that, he, he meets with us. That's why we do this. See, when the veil was torn in two and, and Jesus made a way, we, don't, we aren't stuck with having to hold hope in our job. We aren't stuck having to hold hope in relationships. We, aren't, we, don't, we shouldn't hold our hope in, in even marriage. Like, nothing of this world can handle the weight that we're created to need for a foundation to direct us. See, if you look up the definition of cornerstone, it's often referred to as a stone that was first laid. And some definitions will even say that the cornerstone would be laid in a certain way that would actually direct where the house or the building or the structure was supposed to point. So maybe for you today, you're like, no, all my hope is in Jesus. I'm in a good season. I'm on, I'm on a good point in my journey. All my hope is in Jesus. But if you're like me, I'm prone to wander. I'm broken, and, and I'm often, on an average week, um, whether I'm celebrating, I often rely on my strength, and my strength is my hope. And if I'm in a rough season, I'll, I'll probably lean to whatever is going to help kind of maybe numb that or just kind of get that aside so I can forget about it. And so the song we're about to sing, I almost didn't even do it because I thought, like, who? I don't even know if I could say the first line of this song. But for me, it's a prayer. And so I hope this song is a prayer for you as you worship. in Jesus' name. Sing my hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but hold Trust in Jesus' name, Christ alone, Christ alone, in cornerstone, in weak made strong, in the Savior's love, and through the storm, and He is Lord, and Lord of 
darkness when darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high in stormy gale I know that my anchor holds within this sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone to faultless stand before the throne sing when he shall come when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found I want to be dressed in his righteousness alone oh, yeah. to fall Let's pray. Father, we have been obviously ushered into your presence in this moment. You are here with us. We are grateful that there is no curtain that keeps us away anymore. And it's not that we took it down. You took it down. Because you're the one who pursues us. You love us so deeply. Sometimes it's, it's hard for us to even believe or fathom where we're still convinced that our sin keeps you away from us. We're still convinced that, that the, the sins of our past somehow have disgusted you to the degree that you're not really interested. You are the one who ripped down the curtain. Because while we were still sinners, you died for us. And you longed to be with us. And so, Father, we're grateful to be in your presence. We're grateful that you're here with us in this moment. And so, Father, I just pray that you would speak. I pray that you would move, Holy Spirit. Would you encourage tonight? Would you comfort? 
Would you convict? Would you encourage? Would you do what needs to be done in the hearts of these people, Father? You are a good God, and we're so grateful for your love. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. All right. Uh, got, a, got a question for you. How many of you have ever done what is called a word association exercise? You know what I mean by that? And, and the premise is that someone says a single word, and you have to say the very first thing that pops into your head. And by doing that, somehow you reveal deep psychological, you know, issues that a trained professional can deal with. Good news, I'm a trained professional. We're going to do it right now. All right? And so this is just a quick test run. I'm going to give you one word at a time, and you're going to say yes with me out loud all together the very first thing that pops into your head when I say that word. I know sometimes participation can be a little dicey. I believe in us, and we can do this. So are you ready to try this out tonight? First word that pops into your head when I say the word book. Mark. <laughs> that's good. Well done. I heard worm. I heard, all right, that's good. That's good. How about this one? Knife. All right. That's right. I heard some similar words popping up there. Uh, let's go with Netflix. Chill. Let's keep it PG here tonight, guys. That's good. If you're watching online, play along with us because you can't hear these answers. Uh, when I say the word Apple, pie, amen. That's good. That is the only reason to say the word apple. All right, here's another one for you. First thing that pops in your head, discipleship. Yeah, that's a little less, okay. See, with all the other words, it, it seemed like we were pretty quick to associate those with things that we're familiar with, we know, we recognize, apple pie, right, with knife, fork, discipleship. Do you notice that pause initially? <laughs> discipleship, Oh. It's like we're not entirely certain what it is. We don't know what we associate with it. We're not sure what it looks like. We're not sure how to define it or if it's happening. We have a bit of an issue with discipleship. And so we're going to talk about that for the next few minutes. And this is actually part two of a short series that we started last week. And AJ got up here and started preaching to you. And he said, this is really only half a sermon. And he started talking about the call that he gave to his disciples when he showed up to their work one day when they were out fishing, and he said, come follow me. And they dropped their nets, and they did follow Jesus. Kind of a crazy story. I don't know how it went with AJ at the wharf this week when he went and tried that his, himself. Uh, but it's this picture of following Jesus that is essentially only the first step of discipleship. And it's moving people from kind of the observer, you know, I'm observing Jesus, to actually someone who is following after Jesus. It's moving people from being only eternity-minded and worried about where am I going to go when I die to actually understanding the decision to follow Jesus has immediately, immediate implications for the here and now and that Christ came to give you life and life to the full, not on some future day if we do it well enough. And so this call to follow Jesus is actually this, this big, life-altering decision that is offered to every single one of us, which is good and exciting. Jesus, you know, follow Jesus makes for a good sermon, and it fills churches, and it sells books, but it's only the first step of discipleship. That was only half a sermon that he preached, because it's one thing to follow Jesus, to make that decision. It's another thing entirely to spend the rest of your life becoming like him. Following Jesus is the starting point, but it is not the finish line. It's the beginning of a lifelong transformation, so it was not enough to say yes to Jesus one time at youth camp 24 years ago and hope that that's going to be sufficient. It, it is not enough to say yes to Jesus and, and then to come to church for 47 minutes a week and think, I'm doing it. It is not enough to just drop your nets and follow Jesus when he also said, pick up a cross. Boy, it's easy to drop your nets. It's a lot harder to pick up a cross. 
There's the call to discipleship. But, but it's not necessarily that this bad thing, sometimes we've made it out to be. It's, it's this crazy, wild, twisty, turny, unpredictable, upside-down adventure of chasing after Jesus. And that's what we call discipleship. It's this lifelong transformation, this pursuit of God and, and the things he's going to call you to do and the ways that he's going to ask you to step out and the things that you never fathomed you'd be a part of and growing up and taking risks and stepping out. It's crazy. It's wild. None of you said those words during the word association moment. When I said discipleship, no one said fun. No one said, oh, that's wild and crazy. We didn't even know what to say, church. I think we have greatly undersold discipleship. And for the better part of maybe the 20th century, kind of the church, Western world church, uh, programmed us to think about discipleship as if it was just an event. Yeah, it was something that the church put on for people, and it was usually labeled as, as, or promoted as being purely educational. We even used boring educational language. We said, come to Sunday, school, be sure to do your Bible study, come to discipleship class. We're like, who was your marketing team for trying to sell this to people as something that was big and exciting? And, and so what we tried to do was make exciting youth nights and dynamic kids ministries and these great camp experiences where people could get saved, and they did, people like me and maybe a lot of people like you, and we're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And we asked, what's next? And they were like, oh, can I interest you in a lifetime of academic pursuits? and discipline. I'm like, oh boy, can you? Sign me up for this. And so the discipleship arm of the church was really something that was more educational than it was transformational. And it became a small part of what the church did, a purely optional opportunity for the handful of hardcore church nerds who were really excited about it. It wasn't for everyone. And so what happened over the years then is the church just got really tolerant of spiritual immaturity. It was the norm to just kind of stay where you were, to kind of be stuck without going in depth of what your faith looked like, without seeming like it was going to be weird. There wasn't a lot of intentional deep diving into what it meant to actually pursue this lifelong relationship. And that just leads to a lot of spectating. It leads to a lot of one hour a week, Christianity. And when that's your foundation, what happens over the years and what happens over the decades and what did happen, by and large, at least in the North American church over the last 50, 60 years, we ended up with a lot of larger churches and a lot of weaker Christians. And we've got a lot of people who say they follow Jesus, but they don't look anything like him. We, we've got a lot of people who say they follow Jesus, but they are mostly indistinguishable from the rest of the world. Which is unfortunate because according to Romans, it is our decision to not conform to the patterns of this world that are actually going to lead us to the transformation that we've been looking for. And so perhaps we haven't just undersold discipleship, maybe we misunderstood it. We made it this optional thing, this one little part of your spiritual life, if you had enough time in the week to go to the thing that the church was doing, rather than the call to reorient your entire life around the practices and the pursuit of Jesus Christ and seeking first the kingdom of God. That's what discipleship looks like. And so here's the bottom line, is that every believer should be moving forward in their faith. Every believer should be maturing and growing in their depth and their wisdom and their understanding of what it means to become like Christ and they're putting all of that knowledge to work. Every believer should be further ahead in their faith today than they were a year ago on this day. Five years ago on this day. Some, some people don't buy it. Some people aren't interested. They're like, all right, Mark, sounds good. You're a pastor. You're paid to say it. So to quote the great theologian LeVar Burton, don't just take my word for it. We're going to open the Bible. Uh, there are two key passages I want to highlight for us today. If you've got your Bibles, like physical Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to highlight these, circle these, whatever you need to do to these, um, because we're going to keep coming back to them over and over again as we continue to talk about our discipleship pathway here at the church. Um, the first one is found in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. 
And Paul is writing to the church. He's writing to Christians. And he says to them, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. See, even he makes the differentiation there between, all right, you accepted Christ, that's great, but you must continue to follow him. This was the starting point, but now this is the expectation. And he goes on to say, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. And we just sang that song, Cornerstone, of saying, I'm building my life now on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, and he is the foundation for everything I'm going to do. He is the foundation behind every decision I make, and the way that I lead my family, and the way that I raise my kids, and the way that we spend our money, and the way that we fill our calendar, all of it is because I'm now building my life on Jesus Paul says, you decided to accept him. Good. You must continue to follow. And then we have uh, the author of Hebrews, who is writing again a letter to Christians, and you can kind of pick up a little bit on some of their annoyance with having to, to help spur some of their Christians on. And I talked about how maybe this was just a recent issue. It has not been an issue just recently. This has been an issue for the church since it began, trying to spur Christians on to develop their faith. And so you can pick up some of their tone in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. And he says, so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again, but let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely, we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and, replace, and placing our faith in God. He's like, guys, we've done that. Turn away from your sin, turn to God, the end. We should be well past that. But he goes, we just keep doing this again and again and again. And he says in verse 2, you don't need further instruction about baptism and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. You guys know that when you die, Christ is going to resurrect you. It's going to be great. And so he says in verse 3, and so God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. Do do, do you see kind of the the, the weight that it it carries when you make a decision to follow Jesus, the expectation that this is going to impact the rest of your life? So I don't want to keep going over the basics, the author says. I want us to go and move forward. And there's plenty more examples in Scripture, like the passage that talks about how babies are are drinking spiritual milk because they're young in the faith, but at a certain point, you're supposed to move on to the meat, right? You're you're, grown-ups. You don't go to a restaurant and you're like, I will have one tall glass of milk, please. (laughs) No, you sit down, you're like, give me a steak. It's go time. He said, spiritually, that should also be true. You should be growing up in your faith. Steak is way better than milk anyway. And so that's the goal. The expectation is to mature and grow and be built up and to put roots down and to have this foundation. This whole process is what we call discipleship. That's what discipleship is. And, And I don't think we have struggled with discipleship because we're not interested in it. I think most people are interested in it. I don't think it's because the church is just full of lazy Christians. I think that's a lazy generalization. I don't think any of those things are true. What I think is that we just really haven't known how to do it. We just never had someone come in our own life alongside us with intentionality and purpose and say, help, I want to help equip you and train you up to know how to do the spiritual practices and, and to know how to understand scripture and, and to know how to pray and what it means to meditate on. And, and, and you just didn't have those people. We just went to church and we're like, oh, that's probably it. And, and, and it maybe at some point the pastor was like, you should probably read your Bible, Okay. And so we even knew the tools. We're like, oh, I should probably pray. I should probably read my Bible. I should probably worship. That, all, all those things are good. But if you don't know how to use the tools, then it's actually not any benefit to you at all. Um, my wife sent me on an errand after work last week because we really needed to beef up the old cleaning supplies. Spring cleaning, anyone else? We had, I had to go buy a brand new mop and a brand new bucket, like this heavy-duty jug of cleaning like liquid. We even got the scrub brushes and the gloves. Like, we went all out. And so I, I filled this stuff up in the cart, and I'm pushing it to the cash register. And the thought crosses my mind. is like, this is what people on TV buy after they've murdered someone. <laughs> this is, 
They're, they're about to like cover up a scene or something. And so I get up to the cash register and the lady was like, oh, you're going to do some spring cleaning. And I said, yeah, got to hide the evidence. <laughs> she did not laugh, church. She looked at me with fear and uncertainty. And I was like, yeah, spring, spring cleaning. <laughs> I watch more TV than she does, apparently. Anyway, that, that's irrelevant. That's a side note. But imagine I get home and I unload all these cleaning supplies into the middle of the floor and I'm like, there, house is going to be clean now. <laughs> no, it is not. You've got all the tools, but until you actually open them up and learn how to use them, they're not going to be a benefit. I know how to use them. Just run with the analogy, okay? You got to know how much cleaning liquid mixes with the water, and you got to know what surface you can use it on so it's not going to wreck things. You got to know what ones you can't drink. All the things <laughs> that the label says, you got to know. And listen, to take it a step further, it's actually possible that you could know all of those things. You could have the label memorized. You might even be able to walk someone else through the label. Oh, these are the cleaning supplies I got, and here's the way to put it all together. Just be careful, don't use it on that. Is your house any cleaner? That is the issue. And we've kind of done this with the discipleship. We knew all the things we needed to do. We might have even had all the tools to do them. You, you, say, you should read your Bible. Oh, I'll, oh, I'll get a Bible. And, and maybe you, you even memorized the books of the Bible. When you were a kid, you, oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. And it was like, great. But until you open it up and you meditate on the scripture and you hide that word in your heart that it becomes a light under your feet and a lamp unto your path until it becomes this thing that, that you have built your life on. It's not doing anything for you. So we, we have to move forward in our faith. Now, the bad news is that there is no sermon that is going to be able to do that for you. In the next 10 minutes, can't do it for you. There's not a series of sermons that could do it for you. What we need is some kind of process that people can join into where they are equipped and helped and trained to know how to do this stuff for themselves so that they can become mature in their faith. It's almost like we need a discipleship pathway. And so, what we've really been getting at over these last couple weeks uh, is that that is what we're trying to build and develop for our church, some kind of process that anyone at any point on their spiritual journey can hop in and be a part of this thing so that they can continue to move forward, whether it's their first step into the faith or whether it's their next step in their faith. It's a pathway. We like pathway terminology because it indicates that this is not just some kind of like factory with a treadmill and we're just going to pump you out when it's all done. You'll get your diploma. You did it. That's not how it works. Uh, the journey of becoming like Jesus is never finished. We're always moving forward until the day comes that he says, all right, time to go home. We're, we're still moving forward. And so we like pathway language because it kind of feels like nature when you go outside and, and you can find a new path that you've never gone down before. Or maybe you redo the old path that you've been down before, but this time it looks a little different. Maybe this time you went through it at a different season in your life and things seemed to be a little different. Or maybe you're going through a path you've been down, but you're bringing someone with you and you're like, oh, I've been down this one. I got a few things I could help you with along the way. It's not just a simple point A to point B system. It might kind of meander all over the place. That's how growth works, isn't it? Anyway, right? isn't growth messy? For any, anything, any time, any parents out there, the messiness of taking it like from a baby to a toddler to a kid to ad the adolescent age and just the kid. Is it ever tidy and straightforward? No. Don't you ever feel some days like you went backwards? Like you messed up along the way? Growth is like that. Same thing is true with discipleship. You might get on this pathway and stumble a little bit along the way. You, you, you might actually walk off the path and head into the woods, and you might need someone to come back and put you back on the pathway. It might feel like you're walking backwards a few times. That is okay. Some paths might take you longer than you were anticipating, as long as we keep moving forward. We are pursuing the call of being transformed into the image of Christ um, and, and so we've kind of modeled this design to give it a bit of an outdoorsy feel, kind of a national parks feel, as, as a way of saying, hey, this should be fun and adventure. 
We're, we're pursuing the way of Christ and his practices, and it's going to be great, but we can't do it for you. AJ and, and Tom and Dave and Alex, we're just not, we're not going to put a leash on you and drag you down the pathway. All we can do is point you in the right direction, give you some of the tools and teach you how to use them, and then say, all right, let's do this. And so um, that is our goal as a church. And, and so, you know, when we say things like, oh, read your Bible, that's great. It's not super helpful. Your church might even give you a Bible, which is another step further. But what we want to do with things like the pathway is say, can we help you read and study and understand this Bible so that it becomes a pivotal part of your ongoing spiritual transformation? So that when you go home, you know how to use it. And then you can help your kids understand it and use it. And on and on it goes. So this all sounds good and great. How does it work? The basic premise is that everything we will do discipleship-wise will fit into one of three categories that we are calling gather, grow, and give. And for simplicity's sake, we think every part of your discipleship journey will fit neat and tidy into one of those three categories. Uh, the, the first category is gathering. Uh, these are the events where we gather it's stuff that we're doing right now. When the church gets together, it's community, it's fellowship, it's connection. Boy, is it biblical, and boy, have we missed it. Nothing like a pandemic to remind us how much we're supposed to be with one another. These are the events where you sit down, maybe over a meal, and you eat food, and you laugh, and it's a great time. Maybe it's stuff like celebrate recovery. Maybe it's stuff like board games nights or, or softball games or whatever it is. You're with people. There's connections. There's laughter. There's food. It's good. Gathering is biblical. These are some low-key, invitable events. You could bring your non-church friends to this stuff and probably not worry that midway through it, you're going to get a sermon about hell. You ever brought your friend to church and it was hell day? Like, oh, never again. The next category would be the growth stage. And this is the stuff where we're actually trying to equip you and train you to know how to do things like the spiritual practices. This is the seminars that we offer. These are things like small groups. This is stuff... Um, workshops in seminars, this is conferences, this is classes, stuff like accountability and mentorship, all of that stuff, kind of unashamedly, we're going to say this is the educational arm of the discipleship pathway. You know, th this has been ongoing. We've already done this stuff. This is just part of what we're doing, but this is the stuff that will equip you towards maturity. And then finally, we get into the give category, and, and we hear this word often, and we automatically think finances. Don't think finances think, all right, I came to Christ, I've learned a whole bunch of things, how do I go use it? How do I go reach people? How do I go serve people? I want to do the things that he's called me to do. And so this is using your time and your talents. This is serving locally in our own community or, or outreach events. This is love week. This is about being the hands and feet of Jesus. This is global missions. God willing, someday we'll get to go on trips again and actually go and, and see the people that we're fundraising for and ministering to. This is generosity and funding projects that better the church and better the community. And so ultimately, we think that these things all flow naturally into one another. So hypothetically, if someone brand new shows up at the church, they come to a gathering event, and, and, and it's kind of a, a low-key thing. They show up at Celebrate Recovery, and they find a community of people who loves and accepts them. And they're like, this is not what I anticipated church to be like. And, and all, they keep coming back to these gathering events. Eventually, someday, they say, I, I'm in. I want to follow Jesus. And so they get baptized and we celebrate and then they move into the growth category and, and they're learning how to do things like read and study scripture. They're learning how to pursue kind of their own spiritual practices. They're learning how to grow up in their faith and as they grow up and develop in their faith, they start thinking, well, I want to help out around here. I want to be a part of this. And so they, they sign up to become someone who checks people's names off, the registration when they walk through the door, because hypothetically the pastor in charge of that really needs more people to sign up to do that thing. And so just keep that in mind. Okay, great, thanks. And on and on and on it cycles. They, they, they have gathered and, and they're growing and, and they're giving back. And, and along the way, they're thinking, I've got friends and family who need to be a part of this. Or maybe they're at an event where they're serving and it's a gathering thing. They're like, you should be a part of this. And they now bring someone along with them. And they go to the gathering events and they go to the growth events and they go to the give events with these people. And all of a sudden, we're going through this together as a body, becoming more like Christ. 
Everyone can be a part of this. In fact, this has actually been up and running for the last little while. We just didn't tell you. (laughs) Because all of this stuff is about the whole encompassing picture of your life. This isn't about theology only. This is about how do we help people become better parents and and improve their marriages and take care of their finances and all these areas of your life that are supposed to be touched by Jesus and part of seeking first the kingdom of God. This year, we've already offered a parenting seminar. We've offered a spiritual gift seminar to help people figure out where they can go and give back. Dave is about to offer a financial seminar. We believe this stuff is all discipleship. It all matters in your pursuit of becoming more and more like Christ. And so hence last week's challenge to text the number that showed up on the screen and might show up on the screen here again. We just said type the word first if you want to take your first step. Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Christ or you recently have or you're brand new here. Whatever the case is, that that was to help get you on the pathway that is going to best serve you with where you're at. Some of you text, text, yep, texted, typed, whatever, the word next, because whether you've been here for five years or 25 years, there's something next. And, and then there's things coming up for you that you can be a part of. And so we did our best to respond to every single one of those. Hopefully, you got a response if you, if you texted us. And we tried to send along a list of things coming up that if you're new, here's a newcomer's gathering. Here's Celebrate Recovery. Here's things you can hop into immediately. And if it was next, we're like, oh, is there a membership class coming up? And there's two seminars that we've got coming up around the corner. And and there's baptism opportunities. There should always be things happening that will help people in whatever category they happen to be in at the time. And you'll probably be overlapped in categories as you go. That's how church works. Because we want a strong church filled with strong believers who are strong in their faith and strong in their maturity and understanding because we believe that that can change a community, it can change a region, it can change a province, we can see the kingdom of God expand across the world because the one person who said, oh, I don't just choose to accept Jesus, I'm going to follow him for the rest of my life and do everything I can to become just like him. And so the same challenge is there with you tonight to text that number, to take a first step, a next step. If you already did and, and you didn't receive the picture or it didn't work, we took the next step for you and we printed them. And so out there at the Connection Center, you'll see banners that say first step, next step. And we've got these cards here where it's all printed, the things that we've got coming up for the next six or eight weeks that you can be a part of. We want you to do this. We don't want this to just be like, oh, what a cute two-week series that was. (laughs) This is forever. (laughs) This is, right? And and so this is just what's next for the next little bit, and it's just going to continue to go and go and go. Don't do yourself the grave disservice of saying yes to Jesus and then leaning, leaving all your cleaning supplies in the middle of the floor. He came to give you life to the full, but it'll happen when we draw near to him. It'll happen when we do the work. And God in his goodness and his grace has already done the work of pursuing us. He's waiting for us to move towards him. Let me pray for us. God, you're so good, and we're so grateful for your presence. We are grateful for your patience as we have stumbled sometimes along our own pathway. And, and maybe we've gotten discouraged along the way because it didn't go the way we thought or it wasn't happening as quickly as we were hoping it would go or whatever the case is, but your mercies are new every day. And so, Father, I pray that you would draw people not just into a program at a church, not just into the next event, but into a new, renewed passion to find depth in their relationship with you. May 2021 be a year where this entire church could say, boy, I I dove deep in my walk with Christ this year, and look what happened. Look where he led me. Look what what he taught me. Look at the things that are happening in, in my life and in my family. So would you help us Would you challenge us? Would you break us out of comfort zones? Would you draw us into new territory? And Holy Spirit, would you give us the the strength, the grace, and the patience we need to just continue to take one step after the other? You are a good, gracious God, and we just want to continue to follow you, Jesus. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen.
a few years ago, some friends and I decided to hike the Fundy Footpath in New Brunswick. And we set out, it took three solid days to walk these 20 or 30 kilometers that wound and snaked through the woods. Beautiful, if you've never been to Fundy National Park, it's just a gorgeous experience. But when you set out on this path, you don't look through the woods 30 kilometers and say, well, I guess it's that way, here I go. What they tell you on your way in is you're looking for the next marker. You're looking for the next mark on the tree that says this is the way that you're supposed to go. You don't set out uh, and, and think, you know, 30 kilometers that way and I guess I'll wind up where I go. I'll hack my way through the bushes and wade through the streams and all that kind of thing. You go where others have gone before. You go with the help of others help of your church family, and help of the Holy Spirit at work in you. So whether this is your very first time at church at Yarmouth Wesleyan, or if you've been here for decades, take the next step. We, you'll see out in the lobby at our Connection Center, it's been revamped. There's some new signage and some new material out there. Make a point of stopping by. Figure out what the next step is for you. Text the number on that screen, 902-903-2626, and find out what the next step is for you. We are so delighted that you would come and spend some time with us and, and worship the Lord with us. Uh, thank you so much for your faithful giving, especially through this last season. There are giving options out in the lobby to your right as on your way out. And would you go in God's grace, in God's peace, and in his love. God bless you. Have a great day.